This conference will now be recorded. Hi, so as Matt mentioned, we're going to be talking about ROVs tonight. I think I know everybody out there, but just in case there's anybody I don't, I'm Brian, I'm from Possum Class 1601. So there are going to be three main things that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, first, I'm going to be talking about some of the types of ROVs out there and the features and why those features are important. Uh, from there, I'm going to talk about some of the more unique challenges involved in operating an ROV. And then I'm going to talk about some of the hazards to the vehicle. So what is an ROV? Um, ROV just stands for Remotely Operated Vehicle. In layman's terms, it's essentially a really expensive remote control submarine. Um, ROVs are primarily used where it's too dangerous, too expensive, or too impractical to use a manned sub. Uh, as far as what's out there and what's available, the models vary widely in terms of their capability and their cost. There are actually consumer grade ROVs available that you can get for under $500. Um, the, the consumer grade ones, as you can imagine, are a lot different from the professional grade ones, but if anybody's curious about that, you can search on the term underwater drone. That's what the consumer ones are typically called. And there are quite a few options out there. Um, Typically, they're in the $500 to $1,000 uh, ballpark with professional and industrial grade costing a lot more. Uh, the one that I'm operating falls somewhere kind of in the middle. Uh, with the accessories and everything, I've probably got about $5,000 in it. It's definitely a very capable professional grade ROV, but it's nothing like the ones that were used to explore the Titanic um, or anything like that. And incidentally, before I get too far into this, I do have quite a bit to cover, but if anybody has anything that's on their mind, feel free to just speak up. Uh, you don't have to wait for the end for questions or anything. I like to keep things interactive if at all possible. So what are some differences between the ROV types? Well, as I mentioned, ROVs uh, vary dramatically based on their feature set and how much you pay. One of the big differences is camera quality. Typically, you get what you pay for. The more expensive the ROV, uh, generally the better quality camera, with some of the higher-end ones even having multiple cameras. Also, maximum depth. Uh, some of the consumer ones will only go to about 50 feet. Some go to 100 feet or a little deeper, whereas the professional grade ones, as you can imagine, can go significantly deeper. Uh, also, endurance or bottom time. Uh, there are big differences with that as well. And then the length and type of tether, which this brings up an important point. Radio signals tend not to work very well underwater. Sometimes you can get a radio signal underwater, but they're not very reliable. So as a general rule, ROVs always have tethers. And these tethers vary widely in scope. Uh, some use copper cabling, some use fiber optics. Uh, fiber optics will actually give you a higher bit rate, which means that you can get more data from your ROV in real time. But the trade-off there is that fiber optic tends to be a little bit more delicate than the copper cable. So the, the length and type of tether that is attached to the ROV uh, makes a big difference in price, quality, and that sort of thing. Uh, what are some other I differences? Have a question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so when you mention camera quality and all these other factors, are there any commercial uh, ROV designs that are modular? Say if you wanted to keep your 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 base vehicle bus and improve the camera quality, could you swap out a camera? Yes and no. Um, I haven't seen one that you can actually swap out the camera uh, because the camera is used in navigation and everything else. But what you can do is a lot of them have mounting rails where you can attach supplementary cameras. Um, so if you've got a camera that you really like using, chances are if you've got a professional grade ROV or an industrial grade ROV, you'll be able to bolt it onto the ROV and continue to use that camera as you normally would. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've got a screen capture later on in the presentation where I did just that. Awesome, thank uh, you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so another differentiating factor is maximum speed. Now this seems like a weird one to talk about because when you're underwater, you generally don't want to go fast because you've got limited visibility, you can hit things, you can get yourself into trouble really quickly. But the reason why a maximum speed matters is because, well, for one thing, surface maneuvering, you want to get to the spot where you are going to dive down. But the main reason is because of current. You've got to have enough thrust available to be able to fight the current. Um, also, whether memory and batteries can be removed. Uh, this is a big differentiator between professional and consumer grade ROVs because on the consumer grade ones, a lot of times they don't have replaceable batteries and you have to download the memory directly off of the vehicle. The reason why that's a problem is because if you have 
a lot to get done and you need to perform multiple dives. You really don't want to have to wait for the vehicle to recharge. It's a lot better to be able to just swap a battery, swap a memory card and go. And then of course, size and weight, and then how you control the vehicle. A lot of the consumer grade ROVs um, can be controlled with a smartphone or with a tablet or something like that. Whereas the really high end ones um, have big elaborate consoles that connect to the vehicle. And then there are also units that are in between that you can control with a gaming controller or a laptop or something like that. Another thing that kind of sets ROVs apart is the lighting. Uh, lumens matter a lot because as you get deeper, sunlight becomes less prevalent. And so the lights that you've got are really the only way to see where you're going and to illuminate the surrounding scenery. And again, uh, some of the consumer grade ones don't have lights or they give off very low lumens. Whereas with the higher end drones, you've got lights built in, uh, typically uh, in the range of several thousand lumens, and you can add supplementary dive lights by bolting those onto an accessory rail if you need to. Ryan, a question here. Does yeah. um, do like night vision goggle technology work underwater? You know, that's a really interesting question. I've never actually tried it. Um, I suspect that if the thermal or if if your night vision was thermal based, it probably would. Um, whereas if if it's infrared based, um, you're going to get some reflection off of the the water. But I don't really think it would be too much different than just using visible light. So I think it would probably work. Um, like I said, I've never tried it. Um, Question, Brian. Yeah. This is Richard. Uh, insofar as mounting external equipment, uh, cameras, additional memory cards, lights, things of that nature, uh, do they have, do most of the uh, ROVs, uh, consumer grade or otherwise, have uh, like mounting data or things of that nature regarding weight and balance performance, you know, how it will affect ballasting and controllability? Uh, the data that you can get, um varies widely, but you're actually getting a little bit ahead of me because that's something I'm going to be talking about a little bit later on. Sorry. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, but yeah, with the lights, uh, something else that I found that it really helps with, they're probably not intended for this, but uh, surface maneuvering, because a lot of the dives that I've done, I'm standing on the shore and the spot where I want, want to dive might be two or 300 feet away from me. And when the ROV gets that far away, it can be tough to tell what direction it's facing. But if you turn on the lights while you're at the surface, it makes it a little easier to see what direction you're pointed. Another big difference is the number and type of thrusters that are on the ROV. These play a big role in both maneuverability and resilience. Some of the consumer grade ROVs only have three thrusters, which means that you can ascend and descend, you can go forward and backward, and you can yaw. But if you want to be able to pitch a roll, you need more thrusters than that. In case anybody's wondering, the one that I operate has eight thrusters. And one of the nice things about that is that because there are extra thrusters, you have a bit more resiliency. I did a dive not all that long ago where one of my thrusters got clogged up with some aquatic plants. And so even though I was down a thruster, I was still able to surface and still able to get back to shore. The vehicle didn't perform nearly as well as if I had all of the thrusters available, but it still functioned and I didn't end up losing the vehicle as a result of a thruster failure. You can imagine what the experience would have been like if a vehicle with three thrusters ended up losing one. It would have been severely handicapped in its abilities. So let's talk about some operational challenges with regard to ROVs. Um, ROVs, believe it or not, tend to be really simple to operate. They're a lot like flying a drone, but with a few key differences. So I'm gonna talk about what some of those differences are and what it's really like to operate one of these. Before you so, get into that, uh, Brian, yeah. just one, one question about the uh, using thrusters. So if you have the umbilical cord, um, the copper or the fiber cabling, could you also have like a safety cord there so that if, if it does go dead, can you basically pull it and fish it out of the water? Yes, um, assuming that uh, the cord isn't wrapped around a corner or um, something that makes it impossible to pull in. Right, um, right. On the one that I've got, the data cable actually has a nylon covering, and it specifically says in the documentation that if you get yourself into trouble, you can pull on that to retrieve the vehicle. Uh, some of the fiber optic ones, you may not want to do that because the fiber optics tend to be a little more delicate, especially if the cable gets kinked. Uh, but Stephen would be able to answer that part a lot better than I could. 
I'm just having some audio uh, troubles. Could you repeat the question, please? Oh, I was just, the question was, can you, if the, ro if the ROV gets stuck in the water, could you pull on the fetter to retrieve it? Yeah, and the question is, if it's, is it possible to do that if you've got a fiber optic cable? Uh, in a quarter mile, take exit 14, 40, bound. That's a great question. Um, with fiber optic, it's recommended not to uh, bend or twist the cable too much or else you might damage it. Uh, so I'd recommend against it with a, a nylon covered cable with some of the ROVs that are- Take uh, exit 14A. Uh, middle grade. Uh, you could probably get away with it um, with the laser scanner. I wouldn't recommend it, uh, but also in a quarter mile, slight left. The environmental factors. So, if you're in a shipwreck or a, um, a cave environment, you could damage the shipwreck or the cave, but you could also cut the line um, fairly easily against uh, any kind of abrasive rock or metal that might be uh, uh, snagging it. Yeah, got it. Thank you for the response. Yeah, and I think it also kind of comes down to the situation because even if you're really not supposed to pull on it, if the vehicle's a total loss and you've got nothing to lose at that point, then you know I'd rather lose a cable than lose the whole vehicle. <laughs> That's a, uh, a, a fair dividing line. Um, yeah, I, I, it would depend upon the say. It, it would depend on the environment and the uh, uh, the cost of the ROV. Uh, it, you know, um, it, I, I can always dive down and try and find it and pull it back up or untangle it, uh, it especially if it's in a cave setting. Um, it could make things more dangerous by trying to tug on it uh, if you have divers in the water along with it. Um, yeah, it would depend on a couple different things before trying to pull it back out. Um, but there was a question about infrared underwater, and uh, uh, just remember that uh, red light is one of the first to be absorbed by water, so um, infrared uh, doesn't really work very well underwater because um, uh, most of the light is absorbed, and that's where you get a, uh, a larger benefit out of uh, blue wavelengths uh, that penetrate uh, through the uh, water longer uh, in terms of the water column. Oh, that's really cool to hear. A follow up on that question. What about thermal Im If infrared is not very useful, what about thermal imaging? Uh, so I was uh, speaking in terms of thermal infrared. Uh, thermal infrared uh, will definitely get absorbed by the water. Uh, so if it's warm water, like 70 Celsius or above, or 25 Celsius or above, you're just going to get a fair amount of backscatter. Um, everything will start to look the same color and most uh, aquatic life uh, and environmental factors will probably be around that same temperature. Uh, you'll, you'll get the best contrast if uh, you're in uh, cold water environments in terms of that. So uh, your thermal infrared may or not, may not uh, be effective and that would depend upon the environment. Thank you. Okay, so as far as operating an ROV, as I said, it, it's a lot like operating a drone, although every ROV is obviously different. In the case of mine, uh, there are two sticks that do most of the controls. Uh, the one on the left gives you ascend and descend, and it's also con it also controls your yaw. The stick on the right gives you forward, backward, and move sideways, so it's laid out exactly like a DJI a drone. And then there are three buttons in the middle of the controller. Uh, the one on the left is automatic level, and this one is more of a convenience feature than anything else, but it's something that I absolutely love because an ROV can uh, put itself in virtually any position. So you can be upside down, sideways, whatever. And if you hit this button, it will go straight back to uh, straight and level. And then the one in the button in the middle is the thrust lock button. The reason that you've got this button is because the impellers are exposed. And if you turn them on on dry land, you can cut off a finger. You might suck something up while you're putting it into the water. So it's a really bad idea to have the thrusters running before it's in the water. So that button gives you the ability to power up the ROV, make sure everything's working, put it in the water, and then turn on the impellers. 
and then the button on the right is the lights and the lights are incremental it, it's not just a toggle um, the more times you press the button the brighter the lights get and then you can see the power switch down at the bottom and then there are a couple of controls on the back of the controller uh, in the upper left portion of the diagram you can see a button that controls the open and close for the robotic arm uh, on the right there's a, a button that toggles between photo and video mode and then you can see two dials. Uh, one of those dials control, controls roll and the other controls pitch. Um, now pay attention to the location of the roll dial because I'm going to come back to that one a little bit later. And then we also have an, a data port and an HDMI port. So one of the big operational challenges with operating an ROV is that you can't usually see the vehicle when it's in the water. Obviously when this picture was taken it was in a swimming pool, it was near the surface so you could see it no problem. But you can imagine if you toss it in the ocean or in a lake and it gets more than a few feet below the surface, you're totally going to lose sight of the vehicle. And the very first time that I ever used this, didn't have a clue what I was doing. I'd never operated one before in my life. And I was at a swimming pool with my brother. And Shauna, you know my brother, you know how he is. Um, I get the water, I get the ROV in the water and not three seconds afterwards, he covers my eyes and tells me, okay, you can only look at the controller, pretend you can't see it. Are you able to operate it? It's like, I don't even know what I'm doing. How am I supposed to operate it? But the point being that oftentimes you can't see it while it's in the water. So it's really important to be comfortable with the controls and comfortable with the visual display so that you can operate it using only that. You're not typically going to have that visual line of sight. Weights and balances is a big one, coming back to what Richard was talking about earlier. What you see on the screen right now is the vehicle's default configuration as it comes from the factory. So you can see the ROV, the tether, and when the vehicle is set up like this, it's actually buoyant. It floats low in the water when it's at the surface, but it is buoyant. But that all changes once you start attaching accessories. One of the big accessories is the robotic arm, which you can see right here. And this robotic arm um, weighs quite a bit more than what you would expect. And when you attach it to the vehicle, it's no longer buoyant. And that really, really surprised me because the, the first several times that I used this, I was trying to minimize complexity and just get used to the idea of operating one of these so I didn't have the arm attached. So the first time I put the arm on and I tossed it in the water, the thing sank straight to the bottom and I was really surprised. Now, as soon as I hit the thrust lock button, it leveled out, went back to the surface and everything was good. But it really did surprise me that it sinks um, with the arm attached. So weight does play a factor. Now you. Underwater, it's no big deal because the thrusters are all computerized and they keep everything level in spite of the added weight of the arm. And even if you pick something up, it will compensate for that within reason. But you can imagine uh, what it would do to your weights and balances if you do pick up a heavy object on the bottom and bring that to the surface. Um, typically, it'll perform fine underwater, but once you get to the surface, all bets are off. You've got to kind of be ready to catch it. Now, other types of things that you attach can also drastically affect the weight and balance of the vehicle. And there was another example that really surprised me. When I was putting this presentation together, Matt asked me if I could get some good photo and video of the vehicle in action. And so I had the idea that I would attach a GoPro, but I would do it in a way where I could get the underwater environment, but I could also get the vehicle in the shot. So what I did was I used one of the mounting rails and I rigged it up where I could get a GoPro mount on there. And I used a 12 inch aluminum selfie stick. This thing doesn't weigh anything. And those of you who have used GoPros know that those don't weigh very much either. So here's what the shot looked like. You can see the selfie stick's not very long. But the funny thing about it, I didn't expect this to have any impact at all on the weight and balance because the vehicle itself is really heavy and a GoPro weighs almost nothing by comparison. But when I put it in the water, not only did it sink because of the arm, but having the camera in the position that it's in actually caused it to flip upside down. Now again, when I remove the thrust lock, it rolls right back, um, right side up, so it's no problem, but it does have a tendency to flip upside down when the thrusters aren't running, just having that little bit of extra weight on the top because you're changing the center of gravity. Another big operational challenge is diving in an unknown environment. Uh, this was particularly relevant to a project I was working on recently where I was using it in some lakes that I was completely unfamiliar with. Now, there are a lot of operational hazards when you're operating one of these. You don't want to get tangled up and there can be underwater obstructions. So I wanted to get an idea of what it was that I was going to be diving into. So the way that I solved that particular problem was with something called castable sonar. They make these for fishing. They're relatively new. Um, you can see two examples. There's a deeper and a Garmin up in the upper left corner of the screen. 
what these are is they're kind of like floats. You attach them to a fishing line, you cast them out, and they float on the water, um, and you just reel them back in. And as you reel them back in, they will take a sonar reading, and they will actually build contour maps of the bottom. You can see what some of those maps look like. The deeper one is on the left, the Garmin is on the right. So you can get a really good idea of what the area looks like before you actually begin to operate the ROV. And this isn't a typical thing to do. This was just the way that I solved this particular challenge um, in my own environment. Now, I'm not much into fishing. I don't even own a fishing pole or anything. So what I did was I got my hands on an RC boat, one that um, was a slower one and had a lot of low end torque. And I made some modifications to the boat. And I made it so that I could tow these castable sonars around the lake. And within a span of less than an hour, I had a really good underwater map that I could use to get a feel for where it might be safe to operate the ROV. Another big challenge is loss of visual orientation. Obviously, if you're at the surface, you can tell you're at the surface. And if you're at the bottom, you can usually tell that too. But if you're just in the middle of the water column, what you see on the screen is pretty much what it looks like. So it can be really tough to tell what direction you're facing, or even if you're upside down, right side up, sideways, um, without using your instruments, it's really hard to tell um, what direction you're facing. So that's one of the big challenges that's tough to get used to. Now, another thing that comes into play with re regard to loss of visual orientation is that roll button or that roll dial that I mentioned earlier. A while back, I was showing this to my little niece. Uh, she's in elementary school. Um, she wanted to see what I was doing. So I kind of held the controls down so that she could see it. And she couldn't do this in a million years again if she tried, but she grabbed this out of the control, hit the roll button. She didn't know she did it. I didn't know she did it. But she rolled the vehicle a perfect 180 degrees without me realizing it. So I tried to show her how to operate the vehicle, and all of a sudden, all my controls are reversed. And it just comes back to that loss of visual orientation because I didn't have instruments in front of me. Uh, we were at a swimming pool, so I didn't even bother hooking up the iPad. And I couldn't figure out why this thing was freaking out. It's just kind of one of the operational challenges, I guess. So this is what the user interface looks like for the vehicle. And there are a number of different elements here. Along the top, you can see a compass so you know what direction you're heading. And then just to the right of that is the camera settings. And then down at the bottom, you have an orientation icon. Uh, this shows you the um, vehicle's pitch and roll. You can also see uh, the vehicle's current depth, the water temperature, the intensity of the lights, the pitch angle. And then off to the right of that, you can see whether the thruster lock is engaged or not. And then there's something called depth lock. And I absolutely love the depth lock feature. What this is, is when the depth lock is on, then whatever depth you navigate to, it will hold it there without you having to do anything. And it will stay at that depth until you navigate to a different depth. I've tried operating this without the depth lock on. And I'm sure there are probably some of you who are way more coordinated than I am who wouldn't have any trouble with this, but I couldn't do it to save my life. So I love the depth lock feature. And then off to the right of that, you can see the recording time. Um, another operational challenge is just loss of position because when the vehicle is underwater, it's really, really hard to tell where it's at. It's not like following a scuba diver where you can just watch for the bubbles because typically there are no bubbles. So one way that I got around that challenge is since I knew the approximate depth of the body of water I was going to be diving in, I took some fishing line and I connected one end of the vehicle and the other end to a nice bright orange ping pong ball that I knew would float. And I used that as a visual indicator to tell uh, where the vehicle's at um, under the water. Another operational challenge is bright sunlight. It can be really hard to see the display. And the, one of the ways I get around that is earlier I showed you the HDMI port on the controls. I found that I can connect that HDMI port to a DJI FPV headset, and that will give me a direct feed from the vehicle's cameras into the FPV goggles and make it much, much easier to operate. It also makes the whole experience a lot more immersive. It almost feels like diving. Uh, yet another challenge is silt. If you get too close to the bottom, it starts stirring up a lot of silt and you lose all visual reference, a lot like if you're diving and you get too close to the bottom. And just like when you're diving, lights don't help. It looks a lot like that. One of the really unique challenges with regard to operating an ROV is tether management. Uh, you can see what the tether looks like on mine right here. But when I got the vehicle, the tether didn't look like this. It just came manually wrapped around a big spool. And I found 
when I used it, it was getting tangled up on everything. It was getting tangled up on weeds near where I was using the vehicle, um, just off in the field. Um, I, when I wound it back up, it didn't want to wind neatly and I had a lot of excess tether and it was just kind of one problem after another. So I found this thing they call the E-Reel and it's an electronic uh, tether management system. So it will let the tether out as you need it. It will electronically pull it back in as it's unneeded. It's a little bit pricey, but it's very, very much worth it. It makes tether management so much easier. So some other challenges, maintaining a constant depth, as I mentioned, uh, getting the vehicle in and out of the water. If you're up on a boat, it can be tough to reach down and grab it. If you're standing on a shore, uh, sometimes you may have to wade in um, to get to the water that's deep enough to bring it to you. And then compass calibration. You have to make sure you calibrate the compass before you begin using it or it will behave a little bit erratically. One of the bad things about an ROV is that underwater is a hostile environment. So anytime you're using your ROV, there's a chance that you're not going to get it back or that it won't survive the, the dive. So I wanted to wrap things up by talking about some of the more serious risks that you encounter when operating an ROV. One of the big ones is leakage. Uh, with mine, each one of the thrusters um, has a plug similar to what you see at the end of the robotic arm right here. And there are two O-rings on there, so you have to disconnect the thrusters and check to make sure that both of those O-rings are intact and that the thrusters are connected tightly. And the same with the robotic arm and with anything else that you're connecting to the vehicle because you know electronics and water really don't mix very well. Uh, another big hazard is thruster failure. I mentioned earlier that I suffered a thruster failure on one of the dives. And the reason is because the environment I was operating in where I put the vehicle in um, next to the shore looked like this. So you can imagine how easily that stuff got hung up in the impeller. And then the really, really big one is tether entanglement. Um, and this is something that was brought up earlier. It, it's surprisingly easy to get the tether hung up on things. In the case of this figure, uh, there was an underwater iron pipe sticking up vertically from the bottom of the lake that I didn't know was there. And I went around this thing a couple of times without even knowing that there was an obstacle. And I didn't even realize it until I went to go uh, to surface and I couldn't. So I ended up having to follow my tether back to the point of entanglement and that's what I saw. So the way that I got around that problem was just by using the robotic arm to untangle the tether. But thankfully the water was clear enough to see what I was doing because I can't imagine trying to do that if the water was super murky and there was no visibility. So that's another operational hazard. Uh, every once in a while though, you might find it uh, or you might get a tangle that you can't undo. There's a really cool YouTube video. I put a link to it on the slide where somebody had an ROV that's identical to the one that I use and they were using it in the ocean and they got hung up on a pier. Uh, the barnacles that were on the pier actually uh, got a hold of the cable and they couldn't pull it loose. And they exhausted their entire battery trying to free the ROV and it, eventually the battery went dead and it was just dead in the water at that point. So they had to contact the manufacturer who brought another one down to rescue the dead one. So it's definitely a video I would recommend checking out. And then um, one more operational challenge is loss of power due to fast battery drain. I mentioned earlier that one of the big um, things that differentiates some of the ROVs is um, bottom time and endurance, how long it can stay submerged. In the case of mine, it can stay down for about four hours. But what I found is that there are a number of factors that can really impact that. For example, how bright of lights you're using. The brighter you run the lights, the faster your battery drains. Also, as you take on additional weight, uh, whether it be from attaching the arm or carrying objects with the arm or carrying a payload, the thrusters have to work extra hard to balance the vehicle uh, due to that extra weight and it will drain your battery a little bit quicker. Similarly, if you're in a strong current, the thrusters have to work harder and that drains your battery as well. Or if you have extra devices plugged into the data port, uh, those devices draw power as well and that reduces your dive time. And then one that I ran into myself, oh yeah, and surface maneuvering. Because you can see when it's at the surface, it kicks up a fairly large rooster tail. So that's all wasted energy um, that would be better used underwater. And then one that I ran into myself was cold water. Uh, cold really seems to drain the battery quickly. 
I did a dive where I was actually diving under ice. You can see a picture that I took um, right here, and you can see most of the body of water was frozen over at that point. And what I noticed was that the battery drained super fast. If you look at the screen capture, you can see that I was down to 25% battery, and I had only been submerged for about half an hour. So the cold really does make a big difference. So that's all I've got. I want to go ahead and take any questions and then turn it over to Steven. Hey, Brian, I have a quick question. Yeah. Is this Alyssa? So, yeah, yeah, it's Alyssa. Um, hey. Yeah, so in high school, we actually used to have, or we had like in our robotics club, we actually did like ROV competitions. So we would like go somewhere in Florida. We always did it in, in like a pool because it was like, high school students, but um, we would have to do it sometimes, you know, only looking at the camera and stuff. But we pretty much had to like build our own. And definitely one of the biggest problems that we always had was with the tether um, getting like tangled up on the ROV itself underwater. Um, so I was just curious if that was just like us building it really bad with our poor buoyancy, or if that's like something you experience as well, like the tether getting like wrapped around other parts of the ROV. I haven't run into that one myself, but um, let me switch back a few slides. Um, okay, more than a few slides. Okay, on this one, if you look, it's a little bit hard to see it in the picture, but uh, where the selfie stick is uh, that's attached to the ROV, just beneath yeah. that, there's a, um, a place, a clip for the tether. So you've got the tether going from the data port to that clip and then off to the spool that's on shore. And having that clip um, does two things. One, it helps to prevent uh, the tether from tangling with the vehicle. But the other thing is that if you do have to pull it out by the tether, it gives you a secure point to do it from, so you're not pulling directly against the data port. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, ours were built out of PVCs. They were they were not this high tech, but super cool seeing your pictures and stuff. Oh, thanks. Brian, I have a question. Can you please uh, scroll to the slide where there was a link to the uh, to YouTube uh, video? Yeah. Because I wasn't able to, to open it. There it is. Yeah, thank you very much. In the meantime, uh, I last week or two weeks ago, I found amazing, uh, amazing videos from uh, from James Cameron deep uh, deep sea challenge. Uh, this is the uh, the submersible. I would say uh, this is uh, our, uh, this is not a ROV. This is a submersible uh, which he built, customly built to go to Mariana Trench. And uh, there is a trailer of this video, but there is also. Uh, conversation at the conference when he was uh, speaking about his underwater um, experiments that he did uh, before uh, capturing the Titanic screen uh, screens for Titanic and then after and then of course from his travel to the Mariana Trench this one is 58 minutes but it's worth every uh, every every minute uh, so it's amazing, uh, amazing conversation with uh, James Cameron about the uh, how the ROVs are operated underwater, uh, and this they encounter really similar uh, problems that you you mentioned. But they also uh, they are operating the manned vehicle, so they have uh, some more uh, problems to overcome. And this is huge. This is a really, really nice conversation about it. So uh, I really recommend to, to spend some time for this. Steven, uh, are, we, are you ready to, to give a talk? Uh, yeah, I'm good to go. I... I will give you a presenter. Uh, give me a second, I will, yeah, I will. Uh, well, a quick I, question yeah. for Brian, if I may. Yeah. Uh, Brian, uh, you were talking about the, uh, the the loss of battery in cold water. Is there is there any way to perhaps uh, is the battery compartment sealed, or do you have any way of perhaps uh, putting in some sort of thermal insulation to help minimize uh, uh, heat loss, or should I say, to as a barrier for the to for protection from the cold? 
Um, it would be tough. Uh, you could you could probably rig up something, but um, let's see. I'm trying to find. I don't think I've got a, a good picture of it, but um, the battery is probably 70% of the vehicle's weight and it occupies the entire back section of the vehicle. Um, so you would really have to come up with something large to be able to insulate that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And Brian, uh, last uh, question. When you showed the picture of the ROV, uh, with the cord which is being tangled with the pole and I recalled really similar um, uh, really similar experience from my scuba diving when I was doing the uh, dive master certification we were diving uh, near the the pier and uh, I got entangled in a fishing net oh yeah that was yeah that was kind of problematic because uh, you know, I had easy cuts and I had uh, two uh, two blades to to uh, help myself. But the more you move, the the more you entangled, and that was problematic. Fortunately, I had the partner and he helped me out, and uh, that wasn't a problem. But when I saw saw this pole, yeah, the, I really remember the pole <laughs> because that was the start of my problems. <laughs> Yeah, okay, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, yeah, I will absolutely. make a presenter uh, out of the Stephen, and I hope um, that uh, his lecture will be also really interesting because uh, he has amazing th uh, things to to, uh, to share. Stephen, you are a presenter, you can you can go ahead. Uh, cool, is audio working? Yeah. All right, bye bye. Um, and are the slides running? We, we see them, uh, but they're not full screen. Okay. All right, uh, and how about now? Yes. Good. All right, beautiful. Ryan's presentation. Uh, we're going to start digging into uh, human and machine interactions and collaborations uh, for underwater and astronautics. So um, Brian kind of covered the how and this will be the why and what. Uh, so table of contents to cover some of the basics. There we go. All right, so um, human and machine collaboration. Um, so what is uh, uh, what is this all for uh, and why are we doing it? So um, the why is really because uh, working on the open ocean or in underground environments uh, and then underwater underground environments uh, is costly, dangerous, and data rich. So uh, a rough estimate is um, after training expenses and equipment, uh, you're looking at uh, several hundred to seven thousand dollars worth of cost per day for cave diving. Um, not to mention uh, the health and safety of your cave survey teams. Uh, building out of that, um, working on the open ocean, uh, hiring a boat, paying uh, portage fees, uh, as well as equipment fees and gasoline, uh, you're looking at a thousand dollars a day. Um, uh possibly more or less depending on how far out to sea you're going and uh i think most of us know the rough uh the rough rule of thumb is five thousand dollars per kilo um to get something onto orbit and then uh after that entry fee it depends on um uh your full intention of the project that you're working on so working around uh coastlines and things like that is one thing uh you hop into a wetsuit or a dry suit uh some fins and a snorkel and uh, you can make some maps of a local area. The video on the bottom right showing a kelp, uh, a kelp forest um, survey off the coast of Catalina Island. And some of the uh, uh, 
uh, photos on the uh, uh, left showing a breakdown of access and entry to an underwater cave system in Mexico, and uh, the top right showing some photos of working off the coast of Colombia. So uh, why, do, why do we start having this human-machine collaboration become so impactful? We're really looking at efficiency uh, in terms of data collection and cost uh, depreciation, um, prudence in terms of reducing danger, uh, and then uh, accuracy and precision improvements uh, that uh, are too difficult for humans to conduct in these environments, whether it be from a, a safety or technology standpoint, um, that a robot can stay down indefinitely dependent upon power supply, uh, where a human has to uh, exit eventually because of breathing gas. Uh, so how does this all interrelate between um, working underwater and working out our space? Uh, the center photo of the solar system is showing a, a rough translation of our active um, robotic probes that have been sent uh, to the sun, including the Parker probe and others, uh, Venus, Mercury, Earth, and uh, uh, the rest of the way through the solar system um, and on and out to the exosphere and the heliosphere. Uh, so the whole idea is uh, the more we learn about um, Earth and the solar system, the more we can put into practice uh, uh, so synchronicity becomes key. You can't launch a satellite um, at the wrong time or you'll never reach your uh, intended target within the solar system. Uh, the same idea fairly uh, holds fairly true in terms of working underwater. You need synchronicity between your, uh, your dive team and your surface support team or uh, the laser scanner or a robot will not be in the right place at the same time. Um, or people can be injured because of the equipment or the equipment can be destroyed. Uh, because it's not plugged in uh, before the current is running through it uh, and there's still water um, in the wet mate cable. So um, uh, moving from there, uh, going from the left down, uh, top left down, we're looking at um, uh, a cave survey map of a system I've been doing laser scans of and 3D uh, scans of for the past uh, five or six years. Um, these are the original survey lines. So um, the map on the top left is just showing the fastest route through the uh, the cave system in terms of measuring a uh, 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 three gauge rope placed down the center. Uh, then we start moving into the uh, most recent um, data collection methods, uh, a system called Memno and Ariani's line. Uh, uh, named after the Greek goddess uh, or the Greek um, myth from the woman changed into a spider by uh, uh, Athena made to weave webs for the rest of her life. Uh, this system uses two ball bearings and an Arduino to uh, uh, measure the distance of line orientation, depth, and inclination. Uh, so moving from that uh, top left down to the first gray image uh, in the middle left to the uh, right, we go from a horizontal or a vertical view of a cave system, Taj, uh, Taj Mahal, to a vertical system. Uh, so then we begin to see more of the cave profile um, that lies beneath our feet um, when we're working in the uh, Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. And then once we start synthesizing that data into a full scale map, uh, we have this most recent rendition of the cavern zones of uh, Cenote Taj Mahal and Sistema Taj Mahal. Uh, and this work um, would have remained in this uh, grade one to grade two survey map if not for improvements in science and technology. So um, the transition from analog to digital and surveying underwater is really starting to um, uh, 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 push the edge of what we've been able to do in the past 10 to 20 years um, of cave diving and underwater surveying. Uh, so life su uh, support systems can only bring us so far, and that's where um, we really need to start uh, relying on uh, human-robot collaboration and integration to um, uh, collect more data but Im improve uh, safety for um, uh, team members. So in terms of our equipment, um, we are working off of several systems. Uh, 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 laser scanners, 
uh, the um, Memno system, which I, I had mentioned earlier, which uh, operates off the ball bearing and is placed upon the line by cave divers and pushed in front of them uh, to collect data automatically, or else uh, in the top middle photo, it would all just be pencil and plastic and uh, writing this data down by hand, uh, orientation on a compass, uh, depth on our dive computer or uh, pressure gauges, um, inclination of the line vertically or uh, vertically, um, and then uh, uh, bubble levels for um, more precision accuracy of that inclination, uh, and then length of our cave diving reels, whether that be uh, 25 meters, 50 meters, or 300 meters. Uh, so then we start integrating uh, ROV systems, the R open ROV um, uh, version one on the left bottom center video and the Trident, which is uh, the newer system, is uh, more of your middle of the road um, com uh, consumer to commercial grade uh, system uh, that, um, that Brian kind of mentioned before in his presentation. So uh, what you're looking at is a uh, 4K video, uh, 1080p camera, with about a thousand lumens total. Uh, it can be pulled by its nylon encased cable and uh, it, it's fairly robust. Uh, you can throw it right in the water using the cable and tow it back by the cable. Uh, it's innocuous in terms of size. Uh, it's streamlined, which makes it very effective for um, research in enclosed environments. Um, uh, it doesn't have as many impellers as the chasing system that Brian has, which does reduce its um, uh, mobility to certain extents, but it has uh, a streamlined enough uh, uh, configuration that it can get through a lot of restrictions and caves that uh, the chasing system may just be a little too large for. Uh, in terms of interfacing, uh, uh, the Open ROV Trident does not have automatic depth uh, um, manipulation uh, in terms of cave diving, that's a, a benefit. And in terms of uh, shipwreck diving, that's a benefit or shipwreck surveying uh, because of the um, uh, the differences in surveying open water compared to a confined environment. The depth profiles will be mediated by the, the cave or the shipwreck um, and maintaining a 300 uh, meter depth may or may not be advantageous. If you're surveying the outside of a shipwreck, that's fine. But once you need to start getting inside, uh, you need to have um, uh, a little more dexterity in terms of uh, uh, propulsion and depth. Uh, so we have an inclination uh, or an inclinometer and uh, your pitch roll and yaw kind of presented for its user interface. and it can be operated through a joystick on a computer or through a cell phone or a tablet. Um, closed circuit rebreathers are another um, critical element that are starting to push the limits of cave diving or extend the limits. Uh, on the middle right photo, you're seeing a DPV with uh, open circuit scuba tanks. Um, up until the past five or 10 years, that has been one of the most uh, predominant ways to access caves and shipwrecks. Um, that would normally be out of reach of the human um, uh, body or in terms of uh, breathing gases, but also in terms of uh, uh, ability to swim um, several kilometers in a row, I, whether that be through a, a, a cave or um, across the bottom of a seafloor to be able to survey a shipwreck site. Um, we start to look at no bottom times uh, through um, closed circuit rebreathers uh, through the access to um, reverse lungs and uh, uh, sodium salt filtration of uh, carbon dioxide and the rebreathing of oxygen uh, through the breathing gases. So this is a, a side mount system. Uh, you might see other photos online of uh, a back mount or a chest mount on um, closed circuit rebreathing system. Uh, one photo you most likely won't see is uh, uh, you still require these open circuit systems as a, a redundancy measure in case you have any uh, uh, technical glitches that occur with your closed circuit rebreather. Um, uh, 
so they're temperamental in terms of T-valves and a few other things. So uh, any kind of real shock to the system can cause those T-valves to snap. Um, software goes out of uh, uh, circulation or it doesn't update. Um, there are several other factors that you need to start considering besides uh, uh, just what gas you're breathing at what depth in terms of oxygen toxicity and uh, nitrogen content and other things that uh, uh, bring closed circuit rebreathers to another level of complexity, um, but also give you that advantage in terms of uh, access uh, once you get past that learning curve. So this is where um, the user really comes into play. If these uh, robotic systems aren't um, uh, you, uh, useful and utilitarian, um, they become difficult to justify in these environments. So uh, you want to have something that's nearly plug and play, which is kind of demonstrated in the middle video with the laser scanner. Um, a cave diving team can bring this underwater or a, a team of astronauts can deploy this on a, the surface outside of a lunar lander and scan for orbital debris and, uh, or micrometeorite impact. Uh, impacts or uh, lunar dust uh, effects on the outside of a lunar lander or effects of lunar dust on a uh, EVA suit um, while on mission uh, or post-mission as part of their uh, uh, doffing procedure. Uh, and you just need to have something that, uh, you know, K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the more complicated uh, the system, the more uh, potentials for points of failure arise. So um, the bottom left video is actually uh, the open ROV Trident operating in a cavern system with some of our students from Florida. Uh, and that's another plug and play system. Um, you toss it in the water and uh, you're immediately good to go. Um, you decide your depth, you decide your inclination. And uh, honestly, it's impressive uh, how fast the high school students can um, just immediately deploy it and then start spinning in circles and doing backflips around you uh, where some of the older users are uh, a little more, um, I don't want to say timid, but uh, a little bit more conservative in their use of it. Um, where they'll go and get it stuck in a crag. Uh, we actually did have some students have it get stuck and wedged in between two rocks as they were looking at something, and they were able to uh, uh, shimmy it out on, in the middle of the dive, and we didn't even know it was stuck. Apparently, they were flashing the lights at us, trying to get our attention in the middle of surveying, and uh, uh, they were just able to immediately um, uh, solve the problem on their own from the surface. So. Uh, then that adds another level of safety and security for a dive team. So if there's any emergency that starts happening underwater, um, in the past, usually a cave diving team is left to their own devices and training and skill sets to be able to solve that issue. Um, uh, and you can see on the bottom left photo, you have uh, cave divers working. I mean, that's a 30 meter tape measure, so approximately 30 meters apart uh, with the uh, tape measure bowing under the water, um, taking cave survey measurements along the cave line. Um, and now you can have that uh, that extra element of surface uh, information to uh, call in a rescue crew or uh, to provide emergency responders a direct uh, line of attack to that um, uh, group that might be in distress. So uh, taking it from those uh, underwater and outer space environments, um, working on the open ocean uh, on some dredging projects I've done in Colombia, uh, having eyes on the dredge while it's in the water um, in between dive crew switching is a, a big advantage. Uh, then you know if it gets, um, uh, if it drifts down the line uh, or if uh, anything is going on where you need to shut off the dredge because it's accidentally damaging the shipwreck. Uh, so you start to see serious benefits for the user uh, or the team members um, by having someone who's on a surface interval in between scuba uh, uh, scuba decompression able to pass on that information to the Coast Guard or whomever um, 
an ambulance crew or a rescue team uh, to provide you that uh, that quick response where you may be waiting um, almost a day. In some cases, you can cut that down to a half a day uh, or less, especially on the open ocean. Uh, and that's where, uh, you know, starting to consider the hazards of working on the open ocean uh, uh, or in an underwater environment in a cave entanglement is a big one that uh, Brian bought, uh, brought up. Uh, in the middle uh, photo, we have a, a sea turtle that's caught in fishing line. Um, so, you know, if uh, sea life is having this much trouble, just imagine how much trouble you would have uh, if you ever get entangled. It's not a fun day. Uh, I, I've been on dive teams where friends have been caught by fishing hooks and uh, nearly pulled to the surface. Um, and, uh, you know, you've got to act quickly um, or getting caught in a, a surveying reel or a cave diving line. Um, the more you fight, it, it's a Chinese finger trap. The more you fight, the worse it, it becomes. So uh, uh, that's where having uh, these robotic uh, or machine um, uh, collaborations becomes great. You can have a cutting implement on the robot to help uh, slice a line that might be uh, trapping you. and uh, you know, something as simple as swimming a, a few meters from someone and uh, untangling them uh, could be a life-saving measure, uh, especially if it's in a no-light environment or a halo client environment where they can't even see what is trapping them. Uh, in terms of uh, shipwrecks and caves, you might start dealing with silt storms uh, and things like that. So uh, uh, a robotic line to the surface acts as a uh, kind of a cookie crumb trail uh, for Hansel and Gretel, but the birds won't eat it behind you. Um, so you can have the person uh, grab onto the ROV and have a direct line back to the surface in case uh, they can't find their cave line. Um, or the ROV can act as a, uh, a mitigating factor by uh, uh, dissipating some of the halo climb by pushing fresh water down after you uh, dive through an area. Um, yet again, working on the open ocean, uh you you might become uh uh you might be an hour on um, voyage from shore but that could be hours from rescue depending on the nearest vessel or uh the coast guard um in terms of confined environments just having uh that second set of eyes from the surface to check out what you're doing uh can make you feel that much more reassured in uh any projects you're working on uh, and sometimes you're working with not much more than a few inches off of your chest and back uh, while conducting a survey. Um, and this is another area where uh, machine collaboration can really be effective um, when you're trying to measure uh, cave sections instead of having divers bouncing uh, back and forth between depths to take measurements, you can have an ROV. Um, move the zero end of a tape measure uh, to the location you need a uh, a measurement from to make your life that much easier. Um, and of course, uh, once you start dealing with these electromechanical systems underwater, uh, electricity becomes a concern. So uh, if uh, any cables are wet mate cables, they're already rated to be underwater without um, releasing a discharge, but um, if that cable becomes cut or anything like that, that's where you want to be careful about what you're pulling on underwater. Um, and this video on the top right is a, a fun one. Uh, you need to also think about the dynamics of your own actions. So, uh, you know, in terms of Bruce Lee, be water. Uh, uh, and always have a, this end points up. So uh, one of our cave surveyors accidentally put the laser scanner on upside down in a cave. Uh, and they had to spend a few extra minutes of breathing gas and effort to flip the system over. Uh, and then um, completing that task and preparing to conduct the first scan, uh, as he's starting to swim away, uh, his fin kick causes enough motion in the water column to nearly knock over the laser scanner. So um, this is where uh, thinking five steps ahead of your actions and activities uh, becomes uh, paramount. Uh, so what does this all turn into? So, if we go down the line, um, whether that be in a cave or a shipwreck, um, 
the more data we need to collect. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, yeah, the pictures are beautiful and um, uh, scuba diving is uh, relaxing and fun and can be very rewarding, but what does this all turn into? And uh, uh, what that really relates to is the technology and engineering. So how can we uh, utilize human and machine interfacing from satellite to subsurface environments uh, to produce 3D models to collect scientific samples, whether that be uh, uh, laser ablation for uh, spectrometry or chemical uh, microscopy um, to first response uh, in terms of emergency preparedness, um, uh, but also uh, geotechnical surveys that can um, uh, potentially uh, prevent uh, a, a starship from <laughs> caving in on the surface of Mars or a uh, a, uh, a lunar village from accidentally collapsing into a lava tube that we didn't know was underneath it. Um, uh, so that kind of starts to really bring the whole point home of uh, uh, just how much um, integrating uh, the robotic uh, uh, elements into the human factor can really start uh, elevating the potentials in underwater sciences as well as uh, uh, science in uh, microgravity and uh, out beyond uh, uh, LEO and uh, geosynchronous orbit to cislunar space. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, kind of in retrospect, this is the Yucatan Peninsula. You can see the one or two areas where uh, we've done extensive laser scanning surveys or cave surveys. Um, and this is the entire Chicxulub impact crater. So there's hundreds of kilometers, if not millions of kilometers uh, of caves to survey. And um, then you start putting that in perspective of the moon and Mars. And uh, uh, there's just so much to know. And uh, uh, it would take multiple human lifetimes. So incorporating machines into that uh, uh, into that workflow starts to really um, provide the answers we need to become a uh, uh, either a seated interplanetary species or uh, uh, just more scientifically knowledgeable, but also uh, uh, to know more about the uh, the ground on which we walk. Uh, oh yeah, and we have a, um, a project we're working out in Honduras for July, if anyone uh, is interested in participating or supporting um uh you can see the gofundme link but is there a uh, uh any series of questions yes i do have a question uh, with the uh, type of gear that you're using the insofar as the scuba do you have uh are you pre-briefing hand signals or do you have any form of communication between the divers uh for you know setting up the uh, equipment and taking uh, samples and gathering collecting data that's a great question, Richard. Uh, so part of cave diving training, um, there are about three to five pages uh, uh, worth of the reference book that you have to go over um, in terms of just basic cave diving hand signals. Um, those kind of extend from your basic scuba signals, but then um, uh, have been adapted a bit to the environment itself. So I, I can share those with you afterwards. Um, but in terms of the uh, uh, the laser scanning and the um, uh, ROV, that's something we've started developing over the past uh, few years. And uh, that's kind of been an on the fly uh, learning experience. Uh, so this uh, this blue chart over here is something that we, um, we came up with to do the laser scanning in Mexico. Um, I was working on the surface and my two friends were um, down in the cave system. So, we pre-selected a cave, uh, uh, Cenote Taj Mahal or Sistema Taj Mahal, because we knew there was one point where we could all walk down uh, to the water surface together and there was a pre-collected uh, GPS datum. Uh, and then if they swam along uh, the cave line through the cavern sections, there was another cavern entrance they would get to, um, which is the area we were working in. So I would uh, repel um, equipment down uh, to them and then climb down the ladder or uh, uh, they would send stuff up for me uh, to belay back up and um, 
uh, from there, we would uh, uh, work on a, a strict timetable. So um, once we got to the site, the clock started ticking. Uh, they would take the DPVs to get to the uh, second um, cavern entrance, which was called uh, Sugar Bowl Cenote. Uh, then I would um, drop all the equipment down and uh, we, we pretty much worked out uh, five, five minute increments pretty much. So um, they would do their buoyancy check and all of their uh, safety drills um, near the surface and then uh, go and get all of the equipment deployed in the cave. Um, and once they got all that done about 20 minutes later, uh, I would start the first laser scan. And then uh, from there we kept cycling through um, uh, we we kind of made a predefined uh, range of about a meter and a half to three meters, depending on uh, how much they were willing to swim. And uh, they would bring it down the length of cave. It would complete the scan. They would kind of swim around the uh, uh, the opposite end of the laser scanner um, to not impede the laser scans. And then uh, they would pick it up once they saw the scan was done. They would move it to the next site. Um, and so on and so forth. So we did that over the course of about uh, five days. And uh, uh, each time we did it, we got better and better. Uh, hindsight, we uh, we added some foam to the laser scanner. Um, I don't know if I have a picture of that here, but uh, that made it neutrally buoyant. Um, uh, the laser scanner without that is about 10 pounds. So uh, you start putting that in perspective and it becomes quite heavy. Uh, so we worked out a few different hand signals related to that. Um, uh, and there were actually some points where I asked them to be in the scan so I could make sure that they were, uh, you know, safe and <laughs> okay during the middle of the project. Stefan, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. I just Excuse me, I just have a question about um, the application of the laser. Um, we talked about this very briefly when we were at the CSA, but we're still looking for that missing person um, in the lake. And two seasons later, we still <laughs> can't find him. OK. Um, the problem with the lake, and we've done like four recovery miss missions in, in vain. Um, the problem with the lake that I'm talking about is it has a lot of currents and a lot of stilt. Mm -hmm. So the reason why we dive there under ice because the water is clearer so we can see. But this person yeah. went missing in 2019 and from the cadaver dogs, we know approximately where he is, but we can't, we really can't locate him. So do you think, uh, this laser can can help perhaps even if the the body is maybe buried a little bit under the stilt yeah um i remember you mentioning that now in hindsight so with that missing person uh mm -hmm. our estimates are the uh, so i haven't conducted the scans in a larger body of water that's on the to-do list but right now we know that the laser can penetrate um uh, 30 meters with 0.3 millimeter or three micron accuracy. So, um, you know, sediment in the lake, it depends on how quickly it builds up, but there would probably still be some rough profile of, uh, of the, uh, the person's physique, uh, in the water. So that, that's something we could definitely talk about. Um, one thing we've started working on is a way to do, uh, to do some deployments with the ROV uh, with the laser attached um, through a, a neutral buoyancy system we're developing. So uh, I, I'd like you to follow up with me on that and uh, uh, we can try and figure out what we can do to help. Um, I, I, do you, um, well, I'll need, I'll need some more follow up on the size, depth and currents of the yeah. lake. Um, okay. I'll, yeah. I'll I'll send you an email soon, Stefan. Thank you so much. Uh, very uh, informative uh, session. Appreciate it. You're welcome, Nadia. Yeah, I, I look forward to seeing that email and uh, helping with that project. Steve, uh, one of the slides you talked about, like uh, going in and out, and there's the, the 1% that you're trying to, I guess, the, the difference between the two being less than 1%. Um, and you had a device that you said you can enter like a three-digit code and so on. Um, I was just curious uh, yeah. if, you talk a bit, if you could talk a bit more about that. And um, yeah, I'm just I'm just curious about it. Does it have things like a built-in compass, direction, GPS, that type of thing, or is it Yeah, uh, the, 
The Memno is pretty great. Uh, that's uh, made by a gentleman down. Uh, uh, he was a computer scientist turned full-time cave diver in Mexico. Um, and uh, I, I, I've been following uh, along and have some conversations with him uh, along when he released his first copy of it. He's on to the second or third iteration now. Um, uh, so it doesn't have a built-in GPS or uh, uh, or compass yet. Uh, uh, pretty much uh, we rely on our compasses that are built into our dive computers or analog compasses that we carry with us. Um, the Memno is in itself uh, a, uh, a set of two ball bearings with a little uh, potentiometer that's attached to them. Um, and pretty much uh, it, it measures the, uh, the speed of the ball bearings rotation. Um, and then as you push it along in front of you, uh, uh, it takes a measurement of the line along with a uh, an inclination. So it's really got an incl uh, inclinometer and potentiometer. Um, and from there, yeah, you you can uh, preset three digit codes before you go diving or while you're uh, underwater. And uh, uh, this tool has actually started to become pretty prevalent. Um, uh, uh, trying to uh, work out a, an agreement to develop this with the guy and uh, figure out how we can integrate it into some GIS and remote sensing systems. Uh, but I, I've gotten to play with it uh, about twice now, and um, it, it does get to be uh, uh, pretty impressive. Uh, the stuff that they're doing in these videos um, with a tape measure and a bubble level and a compass would have taken, I mean, I, I've done the same work and trying to do a uh, uh, a hundred meter section of cave takes a month or two, and um, it, this breaks uh, breaks your basic um, grade two survey down to uh, maybe two to three afternoons of diving. Um, and uh, it, yeah, it, it, it's a pretty lovely system. Uh, it's got its own software package called uh, Ariani's Line, which is uh, showing right around here. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that's open. Uh, open access so you can just use it without having to buy the system uh, and it, it is a really lovely little tool um, I, I wish I had one to demo um, I, I'm working on seeing if he'll share one with us uh, to use for some of our projects yeah that's that's yeah I, I like it it's really cool I like those uh, little gadgets that um, you know that we we think about okay what what inventions remain to be made <laughs> underwater diving is a place where there's a lot of opportunities uh, that I see for yeah right <laughs> I I really want to attach one of those to the to the open ROV trident uh, <laughs> really really bad uh, you know um, I the trident can't place the line underwater right now maybe that's one of those areas of uh, improvement. Um, uh, through some innovation with a little manipulator arm or a piton shooter and uh, uh, has the line tie off. But uh, just having that, uh, the Memno attached to a to the ROV, um, you know, you can map a couple hundred meters of cave without having to have a diver in the water. Uh, I mean, it, it defeats some of the fun of cave diving, but uh, uh, it does improve <laughs> making underground maps uh, uh, by a long shot. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks. And I also had a question about your laser scanner. Um, if mm -hmm. if you were to have like multiple scanners operating at the same time, and maybe their scan uh, areas overlap, would that would that work, mm -hmm. or would they interfere with each other? That's a good question. Uh, that's super meta too. Uh, laser scanning uh, the laser scanner. That's laser scanning the laser scanner. Um, I don't know. Um, up until I did this project, the uh, company that made them didn't really have any data on uh, photonic interference. Um, I, I know that it definitely doesn't work in sunlight or direct sunlight very well. Uh, it, the beam gets very, uh, very messed up. It might work as long as those scans are kind of going, as long as the beams are semi-parallel or parallel, it'd probably be okay. Um, <laughs> Shauna, uh, yeah, uh, right. Uh, I don't know if uh, lasers work on vampires. That could be another scientific uh, inquiry. But um, I, I would assume as long as it's a dark enough environment, like once you get beneath 30 meters or 50 meters of water, um, 
uh, it's possible that you could have multiple scanners going off at once. I do have some uh, laser levels I could do a couple of test runs with at the lab and see uh, how much they interfere with it. I never really thought about that before. Um, it may, it may not. Uh, uh, <laughs> now I'm going to have to go play with lasers uh, uh, on a on a new yeah. moon. <laughs> yeah, obviously, I'm thinking of throughput. You know, if you have one laser, yeah, you, you can scan. But if you can set three up or four at a time. Um, yeah, right? Like, oh, damn. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually love that idea. I I mean uh, the cost prohibitive. I uh, it is a it, <laughs> it, it, it's a good uh, you know three of three or four of them and you start pushing uh, on a, a home mortgage. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, we we could maybe see if we could work something out with the company to borrow one or two of uh, their other scanners and uh, uh, get some reference uh, reference data. Well, thanks. You're welcome, Aaron. Great question. Hey, Stephen. Great stuff. Um, not so much a question, just a point of clarification. You mentioned um, the depth lock system on the chasing for going in shipwrecks. Uh, the depth lock doesn't keep you from changing depths. It just keeps you from having to manually hold the depth. Ah. Yeah, well, that, that would be pretty nice. Um. Hmm. Yeah, I need to ask you some more questions about your system, Brian. I, I, I actually came up with one or two things after uh, our conversation the other day. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so the the Trident, um, they're apparently phasing out uh, maintaining updates for it after June or July and turning it uh, completely open source. So. Uh, that might be something that can be added in as a community improvement. Um, uh, I, I never thought to ask the guys who made it about depth locking. Uh, so that company's little background is it's a bunch of guys out of the San Francisco Bay Area uh, that heard about this uh, urban legend or uh, I guess folk tale that uh, a bunch of Native Americans killed uh, 49ers, took their gold and threw it down the bottom of a cave. Uh, and they made the the first open ROV uh, to go and try and find the gold at the bottom of the cave. And then they oh, were like, so cool. oh, you know, yeah, right. And then they were like, well, you know, we have this really great robot. Let's make it open source so other people can go try and find fun stuff underwater. Uh, and then uh, uh, they helped us out on a few of our projects in South America, um, uh, uh, doing surveys of the HMS Mag uh, Agamemnon and um uh, a couple of my colleagues uh projects in peru on some uh uh stone age sites uh that are now underwater and uh uh then we found out about the open rov trident and we we're like oh yeah uh <laughs> if this is going to be open source we gotta hop on it to have some fun and do some uh research um uh, Heidi, we kind of do have a rough calibration run for ambient background. Uh, I can share some of the information on that. We used uh, a series of 12,000 lumen lights, uh, cave diving lights that you can see in the picture in the middle here. Um, and we had them uh, focus either directly on the beam, off to the side of the beam, or in the opposite direction of the beam. Um, and I can share those scans with you. Uh, Richard, reflectors using a limited number of laser emitters. That I'm not sure. That could be a fun experiment too. Um, you know, uh, actually, that that could be pretty damn awesome. Uh, tossing a couple mirrors into a cave and seeing how much uh, 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 area we could scan on. It, it is in terms of the bore site of the laser compared to the uh, camera. So. Uh, if we set up some other cameras, we'd probably get some amazing photos. Uh, I'll, I'll need to follow back up with you on that um, in the next few weeks once I have my uh, uh, COVID vaccine and I can get underwater with it. Um, oh, yeah, Heidi, I appreciate the flaky internet. Ours is being pretty bad, too. Um, yeah, I... Most lights seem to conflict with it. Um, uh, they did, the company that produces them did come out with a system recently that has a uh, half a million lumens attached to it along with a 3D camera and the laser. 
Uh, I haven't gotten to play with that one yet, um, but I can only imagine uh, they must have worked out some of the kinks. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. This is that was amazing presentation, and both of you, Brian and and Steve, you you made uh, a wonderful night today. Uh, so thank you very much once again, and I hope to see you all in next week when we will have the presentation from uh, Shona and Kyle, and they will be talking about their experience. So. Uh, if you have more questions to both of uh, today's lecturers, uh, please don't hesitate to, to reach them at email. Uh, you can also ask me to forward the, your emails to them. Uh, I will be more than glad to help you out. Thank you very much and have a nice night. Just a reminder, we have that shared um, Winston Scott presentation for this course with the the uh, uh, flight test engineering course on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Thank you very much, Jason. I uh, I had this in my notes, but I completely forgot about that. Uh, please don't. Uh, I will send you an email um, day before, and you will get uh, exact information how to how to get to Winston Scott's presentations. Yeah. Thank you very much once again, and have a great evening and good night. Matt, uh, may I ask one quick question before you leave? Yeah, of course. Yes, this is Richard. I just uh, just one quick thing on the the uh, analog EVA suits that uh, we're looking at insofar as uh, EVA 105. For, uh, do they have any kind of intercom or communication system within either between the uh, EVA astronauts and the support team? Just just curious. Sure. EVA 105 is uh, is being done in the uh, dry suits, and the next follow-up course will be in testing uh, with the spacesuit from Final Frontier. But mm -hmm. this course will have the uh, the just a regular dry suit, and uh, we will have a full face mask with the ports for communication. But unfortunately, I don't have the ports for the communication, and uh, from what I know, uh, also. Um, some people from uh, from the practical session. So Chris uh, also don't have this uh, this kind of ports. So uh, no, the, the answer is no. Okay. Well, thank you. I I was just curious. It was a question. But thank there's you. A, because I am uh, right now looking forward to buying such a port uh, to communicate, and I know that uh, uh, guys from USA they have exactly the same uh, masks and communication ports. So may, maybe that that's also possible, but for now it's not. Thank you, thank you, Matt. Appreciate it, sir. No problem. Okay, thank you very much, and have a great great evening and night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. Wonder, wonderful to see everybody here. Take care and be Thanks, safe. Everyone. Thanks, Brian and Stephen. Great stuff. Great night. Thanks, Rich. Cheers. Thanks, Jason. Thanks. Have a good night, everybody. Brian, I'll catch up with you by email. Sounds good. Jason, thank you very much for reminding me.